Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Evelyn Dean Olmsted. Um, I am an anthropologist and I research language and identity among Jewish Latin Americans, and I am proud to be on the advisory board of the Jewish Language Project. Today's event is run by the Jewish Language Project, which is a unit of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. It's co-sponsored by Judaism Unbound, Valor, the Shalom Aleichem Institute, and the Association for the Social Scientific Study of Jewry. The mission of the Jewish Language Project is to promote research on, awareness about, and engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews around the world and throughout history. We do this through events like this, through social media posts, our website, jewishlanguages.org, that you saw in the slideshow, as well as documentation projects. And you'll hear a bit more about all of these amazing programs at the end of today's event. So I would like to introduce our wonderful lineup of speakers today. We have Sarah Benin Benor, who is Vice Provost and Professor of Contemporary Jewish Studies at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion and USC. She's also the founding director of the Jewish Language Project. She received her PhD from Stanford University in Linguistics in 2004. Her books include Becoming From, How Newcomers Learn the Language and Culture of Orthodox Judaism and Hebrew Infusion, Language and Community at American Jewish Summer Camps. Dr. Benor is founding co-editor of the Journal of Jewish Languages and recently started the Jewish Names website. Alicia Chandler is a PhD student in the Sociology Department at Wayne State University with a focus on the non-Jewish spouses of American Jews. She works at the Cohen Center for Modern Jewish Studies at Brandeis University 
conducting local Jewish community population studies. She has a BBA from the University of Michigan Ann Arbor and a JD from Harvard Law School. She's also an alumna of the Wexner Heritage Program. Interestingly, despite the fact that neither she nor her husband have any Irish heritage, they named their children Brady and Morgan. So I'm sure we'll be getting into all of this a little bit later. Rachel B. Gross is Associate Professor and John and Marcia Goldman Chair in American Jewish Studies in the Department of Jewish Studies at San Francisco State University. She's a religious studies scholar who studies 20th and 21st century American Jews. Her book, Beyond the Synagogue, Jewish Nostalgia as Religious Practice, is a 2021 National Jewish Book Award finalist in American Jewish Studies. She's currently working on a religious biography of the 20th century immigration writer, Mary Anton. Aaron Dembski is a retired professor of Jewish history and contemporary Jewry at Bar Ilan University. He researches Jewish onomastics, focusing on given names, surnames, and toponyms, as well as biblical history and Jewish antiquity. He's edited many books and organized many conferences on Jewish names. He's the founder and director of the Project for the Study of Jewish Names at BIU and was the academic advisor to the Diaspora Museum's Archives of Jewish Family Names. Finally, writer Lauren Wattenberg is known for her research-driven, analytical approach to understanding name trends and style. She is the author of the Baby Name Wizard books and was the founder of the website babynamewizard.com. Her current website, namerology.com, features interactive tools such as name maps and graphs and discussions of social and cultural trends through a naming lens. Well, with that, I will be passing the baton to Jacob. And thank you again all for joining us and to all of our speakers as well. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm Sarah Bunin Benor, the director of the Jewish Language Project, and I'm very happy to be um, sharing our presentation with you today. So today's presentation will be a total of 90 minutes. First, we'll start by with the presentation by me and Alicia, and then we'll have responses by Rachel Gross, Aaron Dembski, and Laura Wattenberg, and then discussion, and then Q&A, which is your job. You as attendees are able to add questions to the Q&A, and I recommend that you wait until after the presentation because your question might be answered by a later part of the presentation. The Q&A function should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And yes, the session will be recorded and posted on the Jewish language website and the Jewish names website. Tomorrow, we will email all registered participants with links to those videos and to the full report and to other things that, that are mentioned in today's presentation. And look for articles about the study in various Jewish news outlets tomorrow and in the coming days. So throughout history, Jews have had diverse names, especially names from biblical Hebrew, and then local variants of biblical Hebrew names and local non-Jewish names. And their choices of names represents a continuum from names that are distinctively Jewish to names that are more acculturated, that represent that family's more perhaps um, greater integration into the surrounding society. So for example, in the 10th century in Cairo, we see biblical Hebrew names like Ephraim and Miriam, local variants of biblical names like Daoud and Rebecca, and local non-Jewish names like Abdallah and Jamila. <laughs> and in 13th century England, we have names like Yechiel, Zipporah, Elias, or Elias and Anna, and Peter and Joy. And then in 16th century Rome, we have names like Aaron and Esther and Giuseppe, which is Joseph and Rebecca, and Angelo and Allegrezza. So our question is, how does this play out today? What is the balance of name types among American Jews today? How does this change over time? How does this vary in different subgroups of American Jews? Which names do Jews and non-Jews identify as more Jewish or less Jewish? Who, has, who names their children after living and deceased honorees? And who has a Starbucks name? And who gives their pets a Jewish name? So to answer these questions, we created an online survey 
uh, and we honed this survey based on a pilot version and 60 pre-tests where we asked people what they thought of the questions and got their feed feedback about it. And we distributed this survey in September 2019 using what's called snowball sampling, which means you send it to some people and ask them to send it to other people. And yes, that was three years ago. COVID kind of got in the way of the analysis. Our sample ended up with over 11,000 respondents. And we um, specifically made an effort to reach diverse groups of Jews according to race and ancestry and denomination, and also to reach non-Jewish respondents. Our analysis is limited to those respondents who were born in the US and still live in the US. And um, we have, here are the numbers of the respondents and their children. And we created separate data sets for the respondents and for the children. Now, it's important to note that our sample is not a representative sample. To get a representative sample of American Jews is very expensive, involves a lot of cold calling and, and uh, is, it was way beyond our zero dollar budget. So we, um, we, what we did was we then compared the sample to a recent representative sample of American Jews, the Pew, uh, Pew Research Center's study of Jewish Americans from 2020. And compared to that, that sample, the Jews in our sample are somewhat more engaged in Jewish life. And we have a slightly higher representation of conservative, modern Orthodox, and Reconstructionist Jews, and a lower representation of reform, no denomination, and interfaith families, although we still do have significant representation from those groups. And we also wanted to compare our sample to non-Jews that were um, surveyed according to a representative sample. And we found the most recent study that did that was the NSRE from 2000. And we found that the non-Jews in our sample are slightly more connected to Jews than the broader American population. So while we can't make claims about American Jews in general, like 60% of American Jews say X, or 60% of Americans who tell a phone surveyor that they are Jewish say X, what we can do is confidently compare groups within the sample. So we can say within our sample, older Jews are more likely than younger Jews to do X, or people of different denominations are more or less likely to do X. Now, how did we determine who was a Jew? Because that's a complicated question nowadays. Well, we had nine options in the question that asked about Jewishness. And those who said, I am Jewish and was raised Jewish or I converted to Judaism were considered to be Jewish in our sample. And three through seven were not considered to be Jewish, but uh, and eight and nine were excluded from the analysis of Jews versus non-Jews. Now, the hardest part of this project was coding the names because we had 1,751 names of women and girls, distinctive, distinct names, like unique names, 863 names of men and boys, and 151 names of non-binary, intersex, and transgender people. And we had to code them all manually according to various categories that I'll tell you about in a minute. And I wanna thank Jason Bronowitz for his uh, excellent work in doing a lot of that coding. And I want to thank Alexander Bader, one of the world's experts on Jewish names, for his help with our coding into various categories. So what were these categories? Well, we divided the names up into Hebrew biblical characters, names like Hannah, Ruvain, Yechezkel, English biblical characters, names like Aaron, Abigail, and Ruth, Yiddish biblical character, Avram, Rachel, Yehudis, ambiguous biblical character, so names like Ezra, Leah, or Leah, and Miriam, where the spelling doesn't indicate if they are pronounced in a Hebrew way or an English way, and doesn't, or, or they, the pronunciation might be the same, approximately. Uh, Hebrew biblical modern names, that is names from the Bible that came to be used more in modern times, or their uh, morphology indicates their modern use, like that they are shortened versions of biblical names like Avi and Moti, or female versions of historically male names like Raphaela. 
Then we have Hebrew post-biblical names, names from rabbinic literature or names that came into Jewish communities after the biblical period, like Akiva, Bruria, and Meir. Yiddish names like Bela, Fival, and Leib. And here the spellings are based on how the people who responded to the survey spelled their names or their children's names. Hebrew modern names, names that only came into Hebrew into Jewish usage in the modern period and are not biblical names like Ariella, Lior, and Stav. And here's an interesting category, ambiguous Jewish names like Emmet, Lila, and Mindy. Now, why are they ambiguous Jewish? Because many Jews today use these names even though they're not specifically Jewish names, but they consider them to be specifically Jewish names because of their coded Hebrew meanings, their homophonous meanings, their, the, the fact that they have meanings that are the same as Hebrew words, like emet, Hebrew for truth, lila, Hebrew for night, and mindi, which is a, a diminutive form of mindel, a Yiddish name. And the last category was names of, that are not of Jewish origin, so names like Mark, Randall, and Sylvia. Now, how did we determine um, what to do with these categories? Well, we asked everybody, if you heard of someone else with your first name, how likely would you be to assume that they were Jewish or not? And they could rate this on a scale of zero to 10, with five being the midpoint, which suggests that they were completely in between definitely Jewish and definitely not Jewish. And based on their responses to this, we came up with a mean Jewishness rating for each category of names. And then we decided that those that were above eight on the scale of zero through 10 would be considered distinctively Jewish names. And those that were below eight were not distinctively Jewish names. So the ambiguous ones ended up in this, in this lower category here, uh, this distinct, not distinctively Jewish category here. And we think that this represents that continuum between distinctiveness and acculturation into the broader American society. So I turn it now over to Alicia Chandler to share our findings. Thank you so much, Sarah. So first, going to our first slide, we then looked at um, the percentage of both respondents and then also the percentage of their children with each name type. So what you see is we have a decrease in names of no Jewish origin, again, such as Mark, Randall, Sylvia, um, which is at 55% for respondents, but almost down to 35% for their children. Now, every single other category increases over time. So this almost 20% drop represents um, the decrease that we see between the use of not distinctively Jewish names and distinctively Jewish names amongst um, respondents and their children. If you go to the next slide, we then broke this down by further by looking at respondents and their children by category of orthodoxy and to see who gave their children, who had, I'm sorry, distinctively Jewish names. And we found that this increase um, of percentage of distinctively names increase between respondents and children for both Orthodox Jews and non-Orthodox Jews. Now, we, went, we also went to see um, the percentage of distinctively Jewish names among respondents and their children by decades of birth. So um, some factors that influence the increased use of distinctively Jewish names that we see occur around 1970 is include the increased acceptance of Jews in the United States, um, as well as some broader American trends toward the embrace um, of ethnic distinctiveness. In addition, this period saw the increased use of biblical names in the United States more generally. So names like Sarah, Rebecca, Daniel, and Joshua first entered the top 10 of Jewish names for all children around that time. Now, breaking this out further into categories, we looked at all of the name categories that Sarah identified and looked at um, their prevalence for those before, both of, bo sorry, respondents born before 1970 and after 1970. Again, we see that the use of names of no Jewish origin drops after 1970, but the use of all other um, categories increases after this time. 
we broke this out further just to look at the percentage of respondents' names um, of names of no Jewish origin by the decade of their birth. And as you can see, this drop is continuous over time. So for those um, who responded to the survey that were born before 1940, it's almost 90% had names of no Jewish origin. But by the most recent cohort, those born um, after the year 2000, it's dropped below 40%. So this decrease has continued over time. Then we went through an exercise of looking at all of the names broken out um, by gender of what were the most popular names we saw um, putting together respondents, their spouses, children over the decades. One of the, now I want you to keep in mind as we go through these numbers that when we're talking about this data set, when we break out any specific individual name, we're talking about um, a number of appearances probably in the tens, not the hundreds or thousands that you would see in like a, the social security database, for example. Now, the highlighting that you just saw pop up on your screen indicates the um, coding of these names. So these yellow names highlighted in yellow um, are names that are not of a Jewish origin. Now we see a decrease over time of these names appearing in the top 10 most popular names for Jews in our survey. Now I'll make one note here, which is Elizabeth actually is in a, a name relating to Elisheva, but we coded it as of not, not Jewish origins because the name Elizabeth has such strong associations with Christianity. We also did the same for Matthew and Mary. Going forward, we'll add in um, highlights of blue, which indicates um, names that are English biblical character names, and pink, which are um, other dis um, distinctively Jewish names, and green, which is names that we talked about that the coded Jewish names. So as you see over time, again, the percent of, of distinctively Jewish names um, rises as we go through time. And, this appearance of coded names um, doesn't occur until the 2000s and 2010s. Now in this next slide, we then overlay the popularity in the general culture taken from the Social Security Administration with the popularity amongst Jew Jews in our survey. And what we see is that where there's a single asterisk, it indicates that the name is in the top 200 during that decade. Um, and if there's two asterisks, it indicates that it's in the top 10. Now we see that most of the top 10 Jewish names are also in the top 10, uh, I'm sorry, top 200 US names, but often they're also in the top 10. But then starting in the 2000s, we see that fewer of the Jewish names are in the top 10, of the top 10 Jewish names are also in the US top 200. And that only Hannah and Abigail are in the US top 10. So there's a more willingness of the Jewish community to, in, to name, give names to their children that are outside of sort of the popularity in the general population. And we went through the same exercise um, for boys. So going forward, again, yellow is highlights that indicates names of not Jewish origin. As you can see, these decrease over time um, and completely disappear in the 2000s and 2010s. The highlights in blue indicate the use of biblical English biblical character names, which is very prevalent and popular, as you can see in male naming. And then there's only one single name that appears on this entire list that is considered distinctively Jewish, which is Ari in the top 10, which is Hebrew modern name. Now go on. we looked at factors um, in baby name choice. Um, by decade of birth. So we looked for correlations between the distinctively Jewish names among children by proportion of their parents' close friends who are Jewish. So this is something that is frequently asked in Jewish demographic surveys, how, how many of your close friends are Jewish? And as you can see, that for those who have no Jewish friends or a minority or about half of their friends or close friends are Jewish, there's not much of a rise in the giving of distinctively Jewish names to their children. But when we get to those who categorize themselves as having a majority or all or almost of their close friends are Jewish, then we start to see a, a larger rise in the percentage of who give their children distinctively Jewish names. 
In the next slide, we do we look at the correlation between the percent of children with distinctively Jewish names or Hebrew modern names by the time that their respondent parents spent in Israel. Now I should note the question was not how much cumulative time you spent in Israel, but how long was your longest trip to Israel? And in that, we saw that um, the longer that that trip was, the it increases both the percentage that the child was given a distinctively Jewish name as well as the likelihood was given a, a modern Hebrew name. Next, we looked at the correlation between having a distinctively Jewish name and the family denomination at birth. And what we saw there is that Black hat or Haredi families were the most likely to um, give their children distinctively Jewish names, and reform or secular humanists were, were the least likely. Going forward, we also broke out the percent of children's names that were not of Jewish origin by their Jewish ancestry. Now, when I say Jewish ancestry, what I mean is, do they identify as having Sephardi heritage, Mizrahi heritage, Ashkenazi heritage? Um, now we can find for our analysis Sephardi and Mizrahi families or whether they had a um, mixed heritage of Ashkenazi, Sephardi, Mizrahi. Uh, and what we found is, as the slide illustrates, as that um, Sephardi Mizrahi families um, were most likely to have uh, children whose names were not of a Jewish origin. Did a correlation between the percent of children's distinctively Jewish names by whether the respondent parent was a Jewish professional. And what we found there was that rabbis and cantors were by far the most likely um, to give their children a distinctively Jewish names. But every type of Jewish professional categories were still more likely than those in the survey who weren't Jew Jewish professionals to give their children a um, distinctively Jewish name. On to the slide. We also looked at the correlation between um, just having a distinctively Jewish name and the perceived Jewishness of the neighborhood at the time the child was born. So looking just amongst, in this case, non-Orthodox children, um, those with um, who lived in large neighborhoods with large Jewish populations at the time of the birth of the first child were more likely to have distinctively Jewish names. So we see it increases the larger the Jewish population of the neighborhood, the more likely a child is to have a, non -Jew a, a distinctively Jewish name. One factor we also looked at, which seemed to have um, some significance, was where the parent expected to send their child to school. So they were asked if they just um, expected to send their to a Jewish school to a non-Jewish public school or non-Jewish private school. Now for parents that expected to send their children to a Jewish school, they were much more likely to give their children um, names that were either a Hebrew biblical character name or a Hebrew modern name. For those who expected to send non-Jewish school, whether public or private, they were more likely to give their children names with no Jewish origin or English biblical character names. Now we've talked here about a lot of different variables, but we really had the question of what was having the largest impact on a parent's choice to give their child a distinctively Jewish name. This is for those who care, it's called a regressus. Simplify this. We know that a lot of these variables are correlated with each other. So if you're Orthodox, you're more likely to intend to send your child to a Jewish school. You're probably also um, more likely to um, refrain from handling money on Shabbat. So oh, controlling for all of these factors, which factors had the largest relationship between uh, the, the factor and giving the child a distinctively Jewish name? So what we found when we conducted this regression analysis was that there were a lot of variables that were statistically significant um, relating to the child having a distinctively Jewish name. But the ones that had the largest um, relationship were that longest trip to Israel, which we talked about before, which um, could increase up to, if the longest trip to Israel was 10 months or longer, increase the odds of a child having a distinctively Jewish name by 2.3%, I'm sorry, 2.3 times or 200%. 
And also, as we talked about, that 1970 year is a very strong relationship. So a child born 1970 or later increases the odds of, it makes it over again to 2.2 times more likely that child will have a distinctively Jewish name. Going on to the next slide. We also looked at the traditions around naming children after honorees, whether that be a deceased honoree or a living honoree. Now we found that the Ashkenazic tradition of naming um, child, a child after de deceased honorees was still very salient. In the Ashkenazic um, population, it got, went well over 80%, but even in families that had mixed Jewish ethnic heritage, um, or even just Sephardi and Mizrahi heritage, it was still a very salient trend representing 40% of the families. We then decided to look at this naming tradition after honorees, but in comparing interfaith families to families where all the parents were Jewish. Now that might be a single Jewish parent or um, both or more parents that are Jewish, but if one parent was not Jewish, still almost 70% of those children had um, were named after a deceased honoree, which tells us that this Ashkenazic tradition um, has been ve has very much stayed with a lot of the respondents to our survey. Now, moving on to our last topic before I turn it back over to Sarah, is the topic of ritual names. So many, the, the majority of um, those the children in the survey were given a ritual name, as you can see, both amongst non-Orthodox children and Orthodox children, well over 90% um, have a ritual name. So in some cases, it is exactly the same as their given first name, something that is obviously more popular amongst Orthodox children who are also more likely to have a distinctively Jewish name. For others, it was just a Hebrew pronunciation of a given first name. So that might be... Um, you know, Judah becoming Yeshuda, um, Elijah becoming Eliyahu, um, and in some cases, a totally different name. Um, as I mentioned, it was mentioned in my bio, my own child's name, Brady, um, his Hebrew name is Daron, to name him after his grandmother, so, or great-grandmother. So, of these, we see that most children have ritual names, but if we go on to the next slide, we see that as the use of distinctively Jewish names rises over time, um, the percent of children whose ritual names and given names are identical also increases. So um, this relationship between the use of ritual names and the distinctively Jewish names is strong. With that, I would like it to turn back to turn it back to Sarah to discuss name changing. Thank you, Alicia. So name changing. We, we were very curious what percentage of our sample had changed their first name. And we found that only 4.7% had, very few uh, had, had changed their name. So 1% changed their name to make their name more, more Jewish, 1% to align with their gender identity, and only three respondents to be less Jewish, change their name to be less Jewish, and 2% for another reason, like going by a nickname or because they didn't like their giving, given name or to make their name easier to pronounce. And this was kind of surprising given the great trend in the mid 20th century that Kirsten Vermeglish has written about of American Jews changing their family names to be less Jewish. Uh, but she does talk about how in the uh, 60s and 70s, that, chain, that trend diminished as anti-Semitism got less and uh, as Jews became more uh, accepted in mainstream American society. And that also correlated with our findings of an increase in distinctively Jewish personal names. Another question we asked was about Starbucks names. A Starbucks name is a term for a different first name that you use for some service encounters. And we found that Jews with distinctively Jewish names were much more likely than Jews without distinctively Jewish names to say yes to this question. Um, and we also looked at how this correlated with the popularity of their name in the decade of their birth. So Jews whose names were in the top 200 for that decade only 
reported uh, having a Starbucks name compared to Jews whose names were not in the top 200. So this is about how rare their names were. So what Starbucks names did people choose? Well, like naming after uh, honorees, we have um, a lot of matching by the first letter of the name, like Leora, name, uh, who has a Starbucks name of Laura, and Talia, who has a Starbucks name of Tara or Tara, and Simcha, who goes by Simon or Sam. Sometimes it was English versions of their name, like we saw with the ritual name matching their regular name, like Shaul, who goes by Saul, or Devori, who goes by Devi. Sometimes it was different pronunciations, like if they normally pronounce their name Leah, they'll say Leah for the Starbucks barista because they'll be concerned that they will uh, not understand it or spell it wrong or something like that, or Hannah, who says that their name is Hannah. And sometimes it was totally unrelated Starbucks names like Ezra who goes by John or Yael who goes by Caroline. Now, one interesting thing we found that I didn't know about was that some people have a Starbucks name not to avoid confusion or misspelling of their own name, but to avoid using a common name lest someone else take their order. So sometimes people have humorous Starbucks names for this reason, like Jessica who goes by Batman or Adrian who goes by Hey You on her coffee cup. But sometimes people actually use a more Hebrew name for their Starbucks name, like Ellen, whose Starbucks name is Yocheved, or Amanda, whose Starbucks name is Devora. And sometimes this is their Hebrew name or a name that their grandmother wished they had been given. Um, and this is an interesting example of Jews showing the world that they are unabashedly Jewish. And also some reported having what they called an aroma name, a name that they use within Israel in a cafe like Cafe Aroma because Israelis have trouble pronouncing their English names or to fit into Israeli society like Carrie, who goes by Karen in her uh, aroma experiences and Seth who goes by Avi. And finally, uh, oh, not finally, we have one other section after this. Um, we looked at the names of pets. We asked, have any of your pets had names that you consider Jewish? And most Jews said no. Most of them give their pets American names like Chase and Coco. But some Jews do choose identifiably Jewish names for their pets. And we looked at how this correlated with the percentage of close friends that are Jewish. And the more close friends you have that are Jewish, like with your baby's names, the more likely you are to give your pet a Jewish name. I'll give you a few examples with photos because that's always fun. Uh, there are many dogs and one lizard named Rashi. Uh, there uh, is a dog named Miss Ruthie Bader Ginsburg. This is uh, her with her uh, descent collar. Every time uh, RBG gave a uh, powerful descent, this dog would have the would would dress up. Uh, and then sometimes uh, animals have different names for their regular life and their Jewish ritual life, or I should just say they have Jewish names beyond, or Hebrew names. So for example, this pair of rabbits is known as Oreo and Cookie, but their Hebrew names are Hillel and Shammai, the names of famous rabbis. And here's Golda Meow, a one-eyed cat who has a very popular blog uh, named after, of course, Golda Meir. And there's a lot of punning that goes on here um, not just Golda Meow, but many, many puns on uh, historical Jewish figures. Another common trend is names of foods for pets. So these dogs are named Latka, Macaroon, and Bialy. And this one is Boreka, a Sephardic dog. And another common trend in naming is to give your animal uh, a name that has uh, represents a characteristic of them. And so sometimes these are in Yiddish, like motek meaning sweet, or tsuris meaning trouble, or nitzi klug meaning not so smart. Sometimes they're in Hebrew, like these cats. Uh, one is lev and one is safam. And when I tell you what those words mean, you'll figure out which one is which. Lev means heart and safam means mustache. And sometimes we see non-English animal terms. So Kelev, the dog, Tuki, the parrot, Ketzele, the cat, the kitty, means Yiddish, it's Yiddish for kitty, and Shunra, which is an Aramaic word for cat that appears in the Chad Gadya song. 
Uh, sometimes people mix these up intentionally as a joke, like calling their cat Kelev. And we have biblical names of pets and often names that people would be less likely to give their children, although these do still appear as, as uh, Jethro and Amos do still appear as, as children's names. Um, and this dog here is Queen Vashti refusing to go on a walk. And sometimes we have religious concepts like mitzvah, matz, matzah, uh, sorry, mitzvah, matzah, and afikomen, or afi for short, who was uh, adopted around Passover. And tikva uh, is the name of a cat in this book, and also the name of a cat in, that uh, one of our survey respondents mentioned uh, that brought her hope after the death of her husband. And we also have other Jewish identified names and words like Schleppi, Shiksa, and Lachenkop. Lachenkop means a hole in your head, like I need this animal, like I need a hole in my head. And this here is my dog, Libby. Uh, this is uh, my daughter uh, playing with the dog with one of Libby's favorite chew toys, which is a shofar uh, like horn kind of thing. And Libby uh, was named after Libby, my heart, because she has my daughter's heart, and it also is Yiddish for love, Liebe. And finally, this is Maxi, whose Jewish name is Alta Cocker because she is an old Cocker Spaniel. So what we see in the pets' names is the same kind of thing that we see in the baby names. We see that there are a lot of similarities to American naming practices and also some distinctive features. So in this case, the similarities are, uh, you know, Americans tend to name their dogs with their, their animals with characteristics. And that's an ancient trend where people would name animals based on the spots or their size or other characteristics of them. Uh, food names, of course, are common like biscuit and peanut. Uh, Americans also use puns on celebrity names like Julius Caesar, Rosa Barks, and Kitty Purry. And also naming your animal with a personal name is a new trend since the 1980s and hasn't caught on everywhere around the world. For example, there was a study in, in Asia of, of pet naming and there were very few personal names. Um, so Americans do these trends and Jews do them too, but they also have distinctive features about their naming of pets more multilingual because Jews have more connections to Hebrew, to Yiddish, to Ladino, to other languages, uh, and more specifically Jewish references, texts, values, holidays, and culture. And so again, we see these dual trends of acculturation and distinctiveness. And finally, we asked about various names and we asked people to rate those names in the same way we asked them to rate their own names. If you heard of a girl or woman with each of these names, how likely would you be to assert, assume that she was Jewish or not? And again, it could be a zero to 10 point scale and they could also say that they're, they're not familiar with the name. And what we found was, here we compared the Jews responses to the non-Jews responses. And we found that for almost all of the names, except for Mary, Jews rated them as higher than non-Jews, more likely to be Jewish. But the names that had the biggest discrepancies were the three coded Jewish names, Eliana, which is Hebrew for God answered. But it is also just a general common name in various international communities that was used by non-Jews before Jews started identifying it as a Jewish name. And Maya, Hebrew for water, uh, but also an international name, Lila, Hebrew for night, and Kayla, which is a, um, a common Irish name, but also a Yiddish name. So we see the same for boys, where almost all of the names, except for John and uh, Liam, are rated as higher by Jews, more likely to be Jewish. But um, we also see that um, the names, both among girls and boys, that are the most Jewish, ranked as the most Jewish, are the Hebrew biblical character names like Eliyahu. And interestingly, Judah is rated pretty high, perhaps because of its historical association with the Jewish community. So in conclusion, the names that Jews have given their children and their pets reflect the dual trends of acculturation and distinctiveness, which is important for a minority group. 
contemporary Jews are continuing the traditions of Jews throughout history of naming after honorees and of naming with names that are part of the local population, names that are distinct and names that are somewhere in between. And they're adding new twists, like some new creative names and new creative ways of interpreting names and uh, names of pets and Starbucks names where we don't really have data about that from the past to some extent, although you could consider Esther to be Hadassah's Starbucks name. And finally, uh, American Jews names express both Americanness and Jewishness, as well as individuals specific brands of Jewishness. So when we meet someone and we hear their name, we often make assumptions about whether they're Jewish and about what denomination they are or how engaged they are in Jewish communal life. And that's our presentation. And now we are honored to turn this over to our respondents. Uh, first up is Rachel B. Gross. And you heard all of their bios at the beginning. Um, Rachel, please go ahead. Hi, um, thank you so much to Sarah and Alicia for this really fascinating and informative report. And um, I will say that I appreciate that the title of the event from Rachel and David to Maya and Ezra points out that my own first name was once trendy, but is now quite passe and that the name of my two-year-old nephew, Ezra, is right on trend. Um, his little brother, my six-month-old nephew, Wesley, has a name that is unusual for American Jews. And I'm going to take the respondent's privilege of coming back to talking about how this report makes me think about how his name might be illustrative of some broader trends of Jewish practices in a different way. So I'm a religious studies scholar, and while that can mean many different things to different scholars of religion, for me, that means that I get to ask questions about how people make meaning in their lives. I'm interested in analyzing everyday activities that we might take for granted and understanding how they might serve existential or sacred purposes in our lives, even if we don't consciously think about them that way all the time. So what I take away from this, I think, remarkable report is that naming children is a significant way that American Jews make meaning in their lives and express themselves as Jews, often in ways that are intelligible as Jewish to other Jews. So the authors of this study don't use the language of religious practice, but I find that to be a useful language to help us understand how we make meaning in our lives. And the concept of religion, as we normally think about it, is really a modern Protestant creation. So we often think about religion primarily as about worship, synagogue attendance, personal beliefs. Um, but even though some Jewish thinkers and community leaders have worked hard to make Judaism fit this model, and it sometimes fits that Protestant model, I think we need to think more broadly about religion in order to understand how American Jews make meaning in their lives as individuals, families, and as, as, and as communities. I think about religion as meaningful or sacred relationships and the practices, narratives, and emotions that create and support these relationships. So this includes relationships among the living, between the living and the dead, or between humans and the divine. And my teacher, religious studies scholar Catherine Lofton um, says that it says in this way, she says religion is a way of describing the structures by which we are bound or connected to one another. So thinking about religion as people's relationships with their families, their ancestors and their communities, as well as the really their relationships to the divine, lets us think about how all kinds of people make meaning in their lives, including people who think about themselves as religious and those who don't. In my book, Beyond the Synagogue, Jewish Nostalgia as Religious Practice, I look at a variety of supposedly secular practices, including Jewish genealogy, which connect American Jews emotionally to their ancestors and their communities, past and present. And I think that these activities, including Jewish genealogy, are important enough in my subjects' lives to be understood as religious practices. 
So Sarah and Alicia's study suggests to me that personal names are another instance of the structures that bind and connect Jews to one another that point to the meaningful and even sacred relationships between them. American Jews continue to name children after their ancestors, sometimes with creative twists, pointing to the ways that family relationships play a significant role in American Jews' lives, especially with deceased ancestors in the Ashkenazi tradition. American Jews give their children a range of names that they understand as Jewish, from biblical names to what this study um, has taught me to call coded Jewish names. Naming children in this way suggests to me the ways in which American Jews value a sense of community, including other Jews in the present, and a sense of a kind of what we might say a trans-historical Jewish community, one that includes Jews in other historical periods. So I'm going to conclude my brief remarks by going back to my nephew, Wesley. In contrast to his brother, Ezra, Wesley has maybe a Christian sounding name. And as a scholar of religious history, I vowed to teach baby Wesley all about John and Charles Wesley, the leaders of the 18th century Methodist revival in the Church of England. But Wesley is in fact named for my late grandfather, his great grandfather, um, who was an Ashkenazi Jew born uh, Harold Walensky. And in the 1930s, worried about anti-Semitism maybe affecting his career, my grandpa Harold changed his last name from Walensky to the most Christian sounding name he could find, starting with a W, Wesley, the name of the founders of Methodism. In doing so, Harold Wesley was part of that very large number of 20th century American Jews who changed their last names, as historian Kirsten Vermeglish traces in her brilliant book, A Rosenberg by Any Other Name, which Sarah referenced. And if this study, um, if Sarah and Alicia's study makes you interested in last names as well as first names, I highly recommend that book. So in choosing a last name that was explicitly Christian rather than a last name that was seen as neutral, like Jews who changed Rosenberg to Rose, my grandpa Harold actually made a pretty unusual choice. But as Kirsten from Maglish told me when I, when I told her the story of baby Wesley's name, even though baby Wesley's name doesn't sound Jewish on the face of it, Wesley is now a Jewish name, one that references Jewish family history and a relationship with ancestors. So many of the names Sarah and Alicia analyze in this study are more easily identifiable as Jewish than Wesley's name, but some are interpreted as Jewish only by those in the know, like Kobe as a nickname for Jacob and Liam, um, which I've learned is a name of Irish origin that can be interpreted as Hebrew for my people. So this study shows us that in ways that are obvious or coded, American Jews use names as a tool through which they're bound or connected to one another that they illustrate the meaningful and I would say sacred relationships between Jewish family members alive and deceased and between Jewish community members. So again, thank you so much to Sarah Baynor and Alicia Chandler for this important study and for the chance to respond to it. Amazing, thank you so much, Rachel. We now turn it over to Aaron Dembski. Hi, your greetings from Israel, nighttime. It's now nine o'clock in Israel. Uh, we all want to congratulate Sarah Benor and her students and staff, and especially Alicia Chandler, for producing this important study that is the focus of this conference. Study of Jewish personal names and naming patterns gets to the very heart of Jewish identity among American Jewry. Sarah and Alicia have defined this wide ranging collection of names in terms of the dichotomy between distinctiveness and acculturation. That is choosing names that reflect some degree of Jewish identity and living comfortably in Galut. Actually, this distinction goes back historically to the early second temple period around 500 BCE, when Jews were living under Babylonian and Persian rule and began to take foreign names, some of which were imposed by the ruling state and dominant culture. Certainly, when our ancestors saw, them, uh, saw themselves as contributing members of the later Hellenistic 
and Roman worlds, we were more comfortable with non-Jewish names. America is different. We're living in a world of free choice and for the most part, not dictated by our communal religious traditions and customs. Today, acculturation in naming is to a large extent a reflection of fashion and a matter of taste, as Stanley Lieberson put it. Fashions change by the decade. Of course, there's also Jewish fashions, as Sarah has shown, where we hear a name that sounds Jewish and recognize it as such. Looking at distinctive names, I want to share some thoughts as to why they are Jewish. Some of those names are termed memorial or honorary names, named for deceased relatives, usually grandparents. What makes this Jewish? For other ethnic groups do the same. I would add that we have to see the names in a social context of naming, of naming practices and especially Jewish values. For instance, naming after a grandfather or grandmother is concretizing the value of kibud av ve'en, honoring and respecting one's parents. Now, whether one is consciously aware of this Jewish value term or not, certainly there is family and communal approval, usually, in uh, giving such a name. What I'm saying is that it is not only the name itself, but also the cultural association and social context in the naming process that have to be taken into consideration. Another aspect of distinctive names is new and innovative names, charged from modern Hebrew, as noted in this report. Thanks to various study programs, family visits to Israel, as well as expectations of making Aliyah, many young Jews are influenced by Israeli trends. There is a growing number of American Jews fluent in Hebrew who create new names or redefine Gentile names, giving them a Hebrew etymology. Now we've heard before the Irish name Leon uh, comes, uh, has been given a, a, um, a uh, Hebrew etymology, my people, Leon. But there's also other cultural aspects from the American and larger American community. Support for this name may come from the movies, the cinema, which is always a contributing factor in giving names, a part of the fashion that go on in the country at large. So that an actor who played Schindler in Schindler's List, a Jewish type of movie, was Liam Nesson. So this also encourages and supports that type of uh, uh, popularity for the, that name. Now, many of the innovative names in Hebrew are child-centered as opposed to the honorary names recalling former generations. Again, I see here an overall trend on the culturation. They express the most profound and meaningful aspects of parenting from the difficulties of conception and birth. They celebrate prayers, the Jewish aspect, the religious aspect that Rachel has spoken about, that were answered and expressed hope and wishes for the well-being of the child. And so we can explain the name Eliana, or its comparable form, Anael, God has answered our prayers. Also, the trend for monosyllabic names, like the name Niv, N-I-V, which recalls the Hebrew term Niv Sfatayim that Isaiah introduced. It's an utterance, an utterance that has become a prayer, a form of speech of expressing heartfelt uh, needs and 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 uh, hope for the future. When we speak about Jewish origins, as been defined as Ashkenazic and Sephardi, I would note two other more insular groups uh, that might not have been considered in the survey. Um, they are found in the larger Jewish community that might provide interesting results. The first are the Israeli immigrants to the USA who probably make up a large percentage of those giving distinctive Hebrew names. The other group, the second group, Russian Jewish immigrants, who may not be at all affiliated with mainstream Jewish communities and institutions. It would be interesting to note or to find how they are naming their children. All in all, this report gives us a greater understanding of self-identity of the contemporary American Jewish community 
and provides data for continued study of where it is going. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aaron Dembski, uh, one of the world's experts on Jewish names. And now we turn to Laura Wattenberg, AKA the baby name wizard. Thank you. Uh, I like to take a moment to focus on the American side of the, the American Jewish naming equation. Because I think there's, there's some context that could be interesting as we interpret the fascinating results of this study in our discussion. The first is the difference between past and present in the way we name children. And remember in the study results, the year 1970 was an important cutoff that babies named after 1970 had whole, a whole different patterns. In fact, the entire enterprise of naming children has been revolutionized in the United States during that period. Before that, for centuries before, names were generally chosen from a fairly defined pool of options that most parents would have considered appropriate and acceptable with a core of highly traditional names that remain stable from generation to generation. That's no longer the case. I apologize, but this is not moving. There we are. So today, names change much more quickly than in the past, and parents are actively seeking to express diversity and individuality. They are looking to make an impact and deliberately standing away from convention to help their kids stand out from the pack. You can see the impact of that in the popularity curve flattening. This is a chart of the percentage of American boys receiving a top 10 name over time. So the first bar on the left shows the, 19, the 1880s, which was pretty typical of American and English naming history. A third to a half of all boys would be covered by just the top 10 most popular names. Today, only one boy in every 14 name. So a culture of consensus has been replaced with a culture of individuality. That means that for an individual parent, the menu of options they're choosing from is essentially infinite. And we don't have the rules and traditions of the past to guide us either. So how do you even choose in that environment? For most parents, it turns out that you're following your individual style sense, what sounds good. And sounds, just literally the phonemes of names, are a powerful fashion force that binds entire generations. So today in the absence of tradition, sounds are more important than ever before. As an illustration of that, this is a chart of the most popular last letters of boys' names for the year 1910, which uh, in this case is standing for English naming tradition. There's a range of popularity, but in most cases, the most popular last letters are simply the last letters of the dominant names, Edward, John, James. I'm gonna leap forward 100 years now. Uh, the 1910 graph is on the left, 2010 on the right, and you'll see everything has changed in this modern era. The letter N now towers over the rest of the field. In fact, a third of all American boys received a name ending in the letter N, even though no individual names were particularly big hits. So this is, this is the landscape we're looking at today where sound guides everything. What kind of Jewish names does sound point to? Today's name style tends to be very smooth and light. It's dominated by vowels, not a lot of heavy, hard consonant cluster sounds. You can see that in the top five names in America today, Liam, Noah, Olivia, Emma, Oliver, very smooth. A huge change from the, say the 1900s Germanic era of Frederick and Mildred, or even ostensibly timeless English names like Robert and Margaret. I've kept that big five in America on the screen uh, as a reference and a guide as we think about how sound is pointing us in Jewish names. At the bottom, I have some groupings of names uh, chosen to represent some of the different categories in the survey in terms of origin and language and usage. I suspect most of us looking at these groups of names will sense the social and religious differences among them. But it's worth keeping in mind that depending on how acculturated a group of Jews is, the sound of the moment is going to be pushing toward certain name styles or name origins, such as modern Hebrew names, and away from other types of names like um, 
Yiddish names. And that might be another force, in essence, driving apart naming among different parts of the Jewish community. The other trend I wanted to talk about is actually a trend in Christian naming. Traditionally, the dominant names of English Christian tradition were from two sources. They were either English monarch names and or Christian biblical figures. So this is all led by John and Mary, dominant across the centuries, but not dominant anymore. Part of that is a movement toward creativity and individuality, but there's another factor that I thought was interesting to see in the Jewish Names Survey. This is a chart of the usage of anglicized Hebrew Bible names in the United States. And you see an enormous rise in Christian parents moving away from John and Mary and toward names from the Hebrew Bible starting in the middle of the 20th century, to the extent that for the past generation, Christian babies were far more likely to be named Jacob and Hannah than John and Mary. If you think about what that would have meant to Jewish parents, imagine you're American born Jewish parents, it's the 1950s, you're trying to balance different criteria. You want a Jewish name and a Jewish identity for your child. You also want them to fit in and be accepted by their non-Jewish peers. And you have your, your modern 1950s style sense. All of a sudden, for the first time, all of those arrows point in the same direction. All roads led to Deborah. So as we saw the, the rise of the anglicized Bible names taking over in this period, I think it's interesting to see how the broader naming culture was helping to create an opportunity, a kind of perfect storm of a no trade-offs zone where we had a single perfect sound for an entire generation or two generations of American Jews. And that's uh, those are the main points I wanted to hit on, so I'll give it back to the general discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, do check out Laura's blog. It's called Namerology. Is that right? It is. Thanks. Namerology. Okay, great. She has a lot of interesting analysis of naming patterns. Uh, great. Well, now I'm going to uh, invite all of our panelists to join us on the screen, and we're going to address your questions. We've thrown a lot of data at you, and I imagine you all have, not all, I mean, imagine a lot of you have questions about this. So I welcome you to put those in the Q&A, and we will be able to address some of them. I'm going to start with a question by um, a two people actually asked about the ritual names, and we didn't we didn't really uh, clarify what we meant by that. That's the Hebrew name. That's people's Hebrew name, meaning they have a name for everyday usage and then a ritual name, which is often known as their Hebrew name. But they're not always Hebrews. They're, they're also often Yiddish. Um, and so we call them the ritual name. Um, but the question of so uh, Ruth asks, how common is it today for Jewish children to have two names, English and Hebrew? The English name would would have the first letter often of the Hebrew honorary name, but there would be uh, no closeness to the name. And as we found, we were surprised at how, what, what a large percentage of our sample did have uh, a Hebrew name, 95%, uh, which was um, a, a reflection of our sample being somewhat more engaged Jewishly than the broader population of Americans who tell fo phone surveyors that they're Jewish. Um, so let's, let's see. Um, and I'm also going to invite panelists, if anyone has something they want to ask Alicia or me, or also any response to each other's um, comments, feel free to chime in. Um, so yes, some people uh, are asking about the, um, uh, let's see, oh, Ira says that I guess when he responded to the survey, he submitted two names, one for my son's dog, Dreidel. Uh, was ritual objects a category for pets names? And if so, how popular was it? Um, I, I didn't divide it out into ritual objects, but it, I do think of that as um, a Jewish holiday name. I don't know if your son's dog was adopted around Hanukkah time, but that's often the case that uh, holiday terms are used for animals that were uh, adopted around that time. Um, Libby has an interesting comment. Uh, she writes, there seems to be a certain ownership of that groups and individuals have over certain names and an expectation for where the name comes from. 
She says, my name is Libby. Recently, someone said to me, Libby is from Elizabeth. I said, my Libby name was not. We went round and round about it. I said to this person that my grandmother, whose Yiddish name was Sora Liba, died two months before I was born and I was named after her, my Yiddish name being the same as hers. And my non-Yiddish name is Libby. Elizabeth was not part of the definition. Now this is part of that broader trend that we were talking about of coded Jewish names. And Libby is also the name of my dog for that reason. Um, great. So any panelists have anything they wanna say at this point? Sure. Um, I think that the uh, it's the role of etymology, um, as in this case, in terms of, uh, of the meaning of the name, to me is very much about the story of the name and that parents create for their children. And we see that the same name can come from many different places, depending on what you want it to mean. And you even see parents inventing etymologies, even literal meanings for names that uh, perhaps don't have any linguistic basis because there is a desire for the name to mean something in a literal sense. So Hazel asks a question that relates to Laura's presentation. Uh, she writes, I'm surprised at how Isabel is so widely used by Jews and is even considered a Jewish name given Queen Isabella's role in the Spanish Inquisition. And I think this relates to uh, your point, Laura, about the sound of the names, but also about the broader popularity of the names. And when most Jews choose the names for their baby, they're not necessarily thinking about all the characters in history that had that name. They're thinking about how beautiful the name sounds and uh, perhaps that they've heard it among others in, in their day and age. Uh, so someone asks, are you seeing any quantifiable return of old fashioned English names favored by immigrant parents like Sylvia, Pearl, Gladys, etc.? I have a two year old granddaughter named Selma. Um, yes, the names are cyclical and uh, we do see some names coming back into fashion after having been out of fashion for a long time. And and that actually relates to um, some things that a few people asked about. Robert asked, how about English names that are coded as Jewish? The 1970s conversation with Jewish senior adults, why don't people give kids good Jewish names anymore? Young rabbi, what do you mean? You know, Seymour, Morris, Sadie, Molly. So I think, and it's interesting because these are names that a lot of young Jews see as Jewish because they were so common in their grandparents, great grandparents' generations. Um, and, and some of them were um, like Irving, for example, was, was quite common and even became seen as a Jewish name in the broader population um, because it was, it was named after, uh, often they were named after Itzik or other, um, Aaron, maybe you know, what, what other names would, would uh, Irving be named after? Aaron, Itzik, Yitzchak, yeah. something like that. Yeah, and so so there would be um, they would they would choose an American name that they thought was similar to their Yiddish or Hebrew name, and um, and then those names became so popular among Jews that they were often seen as Jewish names. Um, and that really oh yeah, Laura, go ahead. It could also be dated by decades. So that the uh, Yitzchak and the uh, first generation in the early 20th century became Irving, but then the next generation became Irwin. And uh, then the name uh, kept uh, changing, Irwin. And, uh, and uh, um, of course, Isidore was there as well, somewhere along the line. And nobody paid much attention that it was the name of uh, uh, Isis's gift, etymologically, uh, but uh, was considered a Jewish name. Yeah, and actually, oh, go ahead, Laura. Yes, I think there's an interesting shift in kind of intentionality when you think of, of the uh, past versus present Jewish identified names that the parents who chose Milton and Sydney 
that was kind of a, an Anglo aspirational name is John Milton, Sir Philip Sidney, presumably not intending to give a Jewish name, but actually very much the opposite impression, which is uh, different from today's Jewish naming, which is very much aiming to convey uh, a more Jewish impression. Uh, so, and Hillel also asked about this same question and pointed out that on our list of names that we asked, how likely is this person Jewish, Irving and Rose were on there and um, they uh, were, were seen as more Jewish by Jews than by non-Jews. So, so that, that uh, um, orientation continues today. So, and I'll ask panelists if there are any questions, because there are so many questions coming in, I can't read them all. So if there are any questions that you particularly want to answer, please do that. Um, oh yeah, some people are talking about names coming back, like how Sadie is, is back. And, uh, oh, someone actually asked about what you just mentioned, Laura, um, but I think before you said it, what is the chronology of the Jewish use of baronial names, Stanley, Cecil, Milton, et cetera, as first names? Maybe, uh, Laura, do you have some comment about that? I think in, in general, you're looking at uh, the uh, a children of immigrants generation. And that's that's another big change when we're lo looking at names starting in the middle of the 20th century, that it's a much higher percentage, of course, of American born Jewish parents. So the movement toward the English versions of biblical names partially reflects that. Just um, the the American Girl doll company that creates these historical characters made a, their first Jewish character was supposed to be a daughter of Russian Jewish immigrants in New York in the beginning of the 20th century. But they named her Rebecca, which seemed like it didn't fit either. At that time, you either would have had the old world name or the let's assimilate as hard as we can name, whereas Rebecca seemed to me a, a name of a, a later time. Well, it sounds like they should have consulted with you first. <laughs> um, okay, I, so, oh, great, yeah, I, Rachel, go ahead. Sorry, um, I, I love that comment of Laura's, um, and I, I write about Rebecca in my book, but do not address her um, name, and I think that's such an important point to the way that um, really speaking to the, the stories we tell about, about names, and I really appreciated Laura's comment about stories. I want to add, too, as somebody who's written about nostalgia, I see, um, you know, a lot of these um, names that are recognized as Jewish from earlier eras that, that we've all pointed out um, are not de facto Jewish, the Rose and the Irving. Um, a lot of that, I think, really ties to to broader trends, not just naming trends, but broader trends of American Jews um, feeling nostalgia for that immigrant generation or for subsequent um, generations of ancestors. So I love how all of these, um, all of this discussion of names really fits in kind of broader historical trends of American Jews. And so I'll just um pull out one question, which we got, which was, are there any hypotheses about why parents seem to be naming more girls than boys with distinctively Jewish names since 1970s? Now, getting into the trend of English biblical names, as Laura and others have addressed, we have to remember that the number of named women in the Bible, in Hebrew Bible, is very small, I believe, in around 50 whereas the number of named males is very large. So for those who wanted, maybe made, would have made a choice of an English biblical name, how many to pick from for girls? So then we see a rise in more Hebrew names, which would have reached a distinctively Jewish category, such as Noah, Shoshana, Talia, Yael. So to, they didn't, remember for girls, there's just not as many options in that biblical name category. And we have to consider that in the choices that people are making. Um, one other question to bring up is, is there any trends where, that we are prognosticating? And I, I would never prognosticate, but one thing that a trend, which I hope we don't see, I hope we continue to see the rise of distinctively Jewish names as we do have a trend of increasing anti-Semitism. I really hope that children today don't feel compelled to give their children non-Jewish names or hide their Jewishness more. I really hope we continue to see this trend line continue, but we have to be aware that there is a possibility to go in the other direction if we continue to see um, 
have a, this a perception and reality of rising anti-Semitism in the US. Yeah, that's a good point, thank you. Um, I want to address a question that Amy asked. She wrote, in, in 1961, my Zionist religious school required me to replace my given Yiddish name with a Hebrew one. There was a sense that the Yiddish given name was less than, is that still the case? Uh, and I think it is to some extent, but less than before. Um, now there is, I think, more of an embrace of diaspora cultures in American Jewish life in general. Um, and But I do still hear about people who have a Yiddish ritual name being asked to replace it with a Hebrew one. Um, and interestingly, a young rabbi contacted me and he said he had just taken over from a longtime senior rabbi who had a practice of, of, of requiring people to change their Yiddish names to a Hebrew one. Uh, and like a document that he handed out to parents um, or expectant parents about naming. And it included, you shouldn't use a Yiddish one, you should use a Hebrew one. And he wanted to change it. And, um, and, and so I, I, think, I think that's changing. Mm -hmm. I had a question um, by a rabbi who had um, uh, a congregant whose uh, father's name was Mas'ud, Arabic, and also asked me what would be the Hebrew equivalent of that. And my answer was, don't do anything with that, because that father or the grandfather the name Mas'ud was called up to the Torah by that name. And so it's certainly, even though it's the origin, it's Arabic, it's uh, in that community, it is a legitimate Jewish name. And the same for the Yiddish names as well. Yeah, and another example of that is uh, Maimon. Uh, Rambam, uh, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, that Maimon is, it was a, is a, an Arabic name, but has come to be seen as a Hebrew name as well. Right. right. Um, Okay, any other questions that panelists want to address that have been submitted? I, um, I'd like to ask um, one of the questions that a, um, uh, that somebody in the audience asked. Um, I'd love if Sarah and Alicia could answer it or anybody else. Um, old Tez Jeffrey Nathan, um, or Margaret Winters says Old Testament names in English like Jacob, Aaron, and Rebecca have also become markers of um, of certain types of Christians in the United States. So, and that was a question I had as I was reading your report as well. How does that intersect with your analysis of, of biblical Jewish names? Right, well, that's why we wanted to distinguish between English biblical character and Hebrew biblical character names. And so, and that's why we did not consider English biblical character names to be in that distinctively Jewish category. Um, also that they weren't uh, rated high enough to be to make that cut. Um, but yeah, that's so interesting. And it, people, that also probably relates to the discrepancies in the final section of our of our presentation in the perceived Jewishness of certain names that non-Jews are less likely to consider English biblical character names to be distinctively Jewish than Jews because Jews hear them among Jews and maybe aren't aware of how popular they are outside of their own Jewish circles. Okay, any last chance to uh, address any of these questions? We have uh, over 50 questions that have come in and I wish we could address all of them. Um, oh, here's an interesting one from Amalia. If someone spells the name Aharon with an H, it, will it sound more Jewish than spelling it A-A-R-O-N? Um, and so I guess that's a, a question for you, Aaron Dembski. Uh, I was very lucky, uh, born in 1938, when uh, my friends uh, were being called Stanley and Seymour and other Jewish names of that sort. And my parents decided that they wanted to name me after my grandfather was Aaron and um, spelled it without the H, which may be confusing to the uh, English reader. So that I think that uh, I was lucky in the, the, their choice. Uh, and, have... and, yeah, and, and in our coding, we coded Aharon as 
Hebrew biblical character and A-A-R-O-N, Aaron, as English. And now it's certainly possible that people used the name Aaron as a given name, but just called the child Aharon. Um, and uh, so, so a lot of a lot of um, the data here is is just based on the spelling of the name, where there might be other things going on beyond that. Um, and one other question is um, in the chart of Jewish and non-Jewish names, Susan and Jessica were coded as uh, of Jewish origin. It, and, and that is an interesting question. Why? What makes them Jewish? Well, they come from Shoshana and Yiska, which are biblical characters. They are English versions of biblical names, but they weren't used by Jews because of that. In fact, probably most Jews who use them weren't aware of that origin, um, but they, um, but we, we still coded them as such. And, and there were some questions in our coding. What should we code this as? Because people might not be thinking of that as this minor character in the Tanakh, um, and but that doesn't matter. It, what matters is is its origin. The, the, we did make a few exceptions, as we said, for Elizabeth, uh, and uh, which is Elisheva, and Matthew, and Maria, and Mary. Um, okay, well, uh, we are we're just about out of time, but before we go, we have some updates from the Jewish Language Project. So I'm going to invite Evelyn Dean Olmsted to come on. She is, as you heard, a member of our advisory board. And, uh, and then Jacob will also tell you a little something else after Evelyn. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah and Alicia and all of our panelists. Um, and thank you, thank you for having me on. Um, it's been an honor to serve as an advisory board member. This is all these amazing questions in the chat that I'm seeing um, that need to be answered, that need more research. We all have names, we all have connections to those names, and there's a lot more work to be done clearly. And that's why Jewish Language Project is so important. You know, a lot of times this kind of research might get buried in an academic conference or a journal, but the Jewish Language Project is so unique because it brings together, we have scholars, artists, um, community members, students, all of these people working collaboratively to make these events happen. I am one of Sarah's many, many mentees um, throughout the generation. She's mentored a lot of us Jewish language scholars, so I'm really gratified to see this work continue. And because of that, I have made a donation, a monthly sustaining donation to the Jewish Language Project. It's very easy to do. You just have to go on their webpage and um, click on the donate button and I've made mine a ten dollar a month. Um, Jacob is going to tell you a, a few more about some of the initiatives that that my donation will be funding but I please encourage you if you enjoyed this if you want to see more research like this more presentations like this it is really really critical to get involved. Um, you know funding from universities is becoming scarce bigger foundations are becoming scarce it really this really really is a grassroots effort so please do even if it's just a one-time thank you donation for this amazing amazing presentation it will be put to good use as Jacob will be explaining to you all. Thank you. And now I turn it over to Jacob Codner, who is the Jewish Language Project's Documentation Manager. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for the wonderful presentation today. I'm Jacob Codner, the Documentation Manager for the Jewish Language Project. One of the initiatives I've been working on is documenting endangered Iranian Jewish languages. With the help of many volunteers, we have filmed 20 interviews, songs, plays, and other cultural artifacts in 10 Jewish Iranian languages, such as Judeo Shirazi, Judeo Esfahani, and Judeo Hamadani. Of these videos, we have transcribed, translated, and subtitled seven of these, many of which you can find on our website. Note that the speakers of these languages are mostly in their 80s or older. Many of these languages are endangered, and many of them have little or no documentation. It is imperative that we document and raise awareness about these languages in the next decade, for the sake of the elderly Jews who are their last speakers, and for the sake of Jewish children who would benefit from knowing about their multifaceted heritage. In addition to research, we do a lot of work to raise awareness about these languages. In the fall, we will have our series on Jewish women's writings and songs on October 30th and November 13th. In the spring, we will have a 12-part class on endangered Jewish languages. I have a few more updates about our Redbubble, social media accounts, and mailing lists. 
By popular demand, we've opened a shop on Redbubble. We're selling multilingual Rosh Hashanah cards, posters, tote bags, aprons, and much more. We post in our fun facts series, like the, one, like the ones you saw at the beginning of the webinar, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Everyone who registered for this event will get an email tomorrow with all of these links, but we won't automatically add you to our email list. If you want to keep up with the news of our exciting work, of our initiatives and events, please join our mailing list. We're careful not to send too much email. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you at our future events.